And uh, so I'm relying on his spirit and his word uh, to do the work that only he can do. And so uh, I love the words of the Apostle Paul, a co-pastor, Pastor, Pastor uh, Rosano, just preached this passage a couple of weeks ago, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1 and 2. And when, and I, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Father in heaven, we come to you with great gratitude for what you have already done in us. We have no opportunity to boast in ourselves or in any other man except the God-man, Jesus Christ. For what you have done is truly amazing. And so we love to tell the story because it is the story of your grace, your greatness, your love, and your mercy. And it is my prayer, Lord, that you would speak in spite of my own weakness and speak your precious word to our hearts tonight. If your spirit takes these truths and applies them to our hearts, we will walk away encouraged, strengthened, challenged, maybe convicted, but most importantly, drawn to glorify our God. It's to that end I pray for your glory in the name of Jesus, who glorified the Father more than any other could. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, it is a, it is a joy to preach Christ. Christ is, is the central message of this book. Uh, as we look at Old and, and New Covenant, Old and New Testament, we see Christ. And I just I had the opportunity, to, and I'm reminded I have this little bracelet, uh, to preach Christ, to teach on Christology, the doctrine of Christ, to uh, young students in Zambia, Africa. And what a blessing to see them grapple with these unsearchable riches. And so I hope tonight, as we look at the topic that I've been assigned, it'll be a blessing. Not because of me, but because God has given us this rich truth to encourage us and strengthen us, and also by which he would save us. I want to read out of the same passage that Pastor Phillips read out of. And I'll be spending some more time here in this passage. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. I'm reading out of the uh, ESV, English Standard Version. It may be different from uh, the version that you have. But now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Leon Morris, commentator, said that this is possibly the most important single paragraph in the Bible. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, great preacher from the last century, said this, it is no exaggeration to say in this section that it is one of the greatest and most important sections in the whole of Scripture. Now, the topic that uh, I chose out of those that were given to me was, to choose from, was this. Christ's imputed righteousness as it relates to his atonement. And as I was thinking through this, this um, idea, I was drawn to Romans chapter 3 and Romans chapter 4. And we're going to look at these two texts. Um, and, and I think we're going to see this, this idea, this idea of justification, this idea of imputed righteousness. And we're going to see that which undergirds it that which enables it, so that we could enjoy this great salvation, so 
that we could stand right before God. Now that's kind of a, a, a lengthy description, or at least a wordy description. Christ imputed righteousness as it relates to his atonement. If I put that on the billboard outside, we, we probably get a lot of people coming, oh, I can't wait to hear that message. And we could talk about double imputation, which we'll talk about later, and all these words. But here, here's the point. I hope this simple point comes through as we look at the text tonight. Simply this. God grants righteousness, a right standing to the unrighteousness through faith in Christ. But think about this. God justifies the ungodly. Isn't that an amazing truth? That comes right out of Romans chapter 4. He justifies the ungodly. He gives a right standing to those who are unrighteous. How in the world? Well, it's through imputation. It's through this idea of justification. But most importantly, it's grounded in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And so I get to preach on Christ. What a great blessing. So you're already there in Romans chapter 3, and we're going to take a look at this. A couple of questions that a lot of people struggle with. How can man be right with God? How can unrighteous, ungodly, God-hating, rebel man be right with God? How can that be? And then if he can be made right with God, well, how can God be righteous and make God and make man right with him? How can he allow ungodly man to be right with him and still maintain his righteousness? These are, these are questions that I think our texts will answer tonight and help us as we understand how great a salvation that we have. First thing we're going to see, really the main thing, is that there is a righteous standing for the unrighteous. There is a right standing. There is a right standing for the ungodly. And yes, those who have been appointed by God. But they are unrighteous. You know what's interesting? There are two groups of people. Those who were ungodly, Right? And those who are ungodly. And we still sin. But there are two groups. We, all, we always think about those who are saved and those who are unsaved. That's true. But, but remember, all of us were dead in our trespasses. Weren't we? All of us were lost in unrighteousness. All of us in need of righteousness. And what we're going to see first is that God is the source of this right standing. Again, look at verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. In other words, God is the source. God is the foundation of this right standing. It comes from Him and no other. And, and that's very important for us to understand. That's why we see this statement, the righteousness of God. Some translations say the righteousness is from God, but just hold on to this phrase, the righteousness of God. It means that this is a righteousness that God has brought to man. This is a standing that God has given. If you look back at Romans chapter 1, you will see very similar language in verse 16 and particularly in verse 17. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith, for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. There you see it again, the righteousness of God. Now that, that should be a statement that sounds wonderful to us, the righteousness of God. Because you know what Paul has done from Romans 1.18 all the way through Romans 3, verse 20? He's made clear, he's labored, he's ensured that we would understand that we are not righteous. That we are ungodly. That every single person on the planet is unrighteous and has not a right standing with, with God. And, and so from verse 18, where we see the wrath of God being revealed all the way through chapter 3, Verse 20, the whole point is not just to make sure that the pagans understand that they are unrighteous, but to make sure that the self-righteous understand that they are unrighteous. To make sure that the religious understand that they are unrighteous. And he labors to make sure that the Jew and the Gentile understand that all of them are unrighteous. And this is summed up 
most concisely in chapter 3, verse 10, where we see, as it is, none is righteous. No, not one, as we heard earlier. And so by the time we get to verse 21, you can understand, we are anticipating something. We've been lost if God is doing his work in our hearts, and this is how God has brought you to salvation in some fashion, some form. You recognize that you were dead first. You recognize that you were unrighteous, and you need righteousness. Isn't that our condition? We need righteousness, and we have none. We are lost in our sins. There's nothing that we can do. But now, verse 21, the righteousness of God has been manifested. That's like water to a thirsty soul. Right? That's what the person who is being worked on by the Spirit of God needs to know. Yes, righteousness is what I need. Not just any righteousness, but a perfect righteousness. And who does that come from? Only God. Only God. The righteousness of God has been Manifest. So that's what I want. I want that perfect righteousness because it's the only righteousness that will do. And that's why it's repeated in verse 21 and verse 22. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested. Verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And that right standing will not come by human achievement, as we have, have heard. It, will, it won't come by our merit. That was made perfectly clear in Romans 1, 18 through chapter 3, verse 20. It is manifest, according to verse 21, look at that, apart from the law. It cannot come by work. It cannot come by merit. It cannot come through the law. Now the law and the prophets bear witness to this righteousness. They do that. That's what it says in verse 21. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, they speak of it. They speak of this perfect righteousness of God. The law declares the righteousness of God. It looks forward to the righteous one who would come. But you know, when we look at that word, we recognize that we, we need more than information about righteousness. Right? We need more than knowledge about righteousness. We need to be covered by that righteousness. We need to be granted that right standing. We need to be credited with that righteousness. That's what we need. And that's really what the word manifest is getting at. It's a similar word to the word that we saw in verse 17 of chapter 1. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed. Here the word manifested. Both can be translated revealed or manifested. But essentially they're saying the same thing. And that is that the righteousness of God can be shown, it can be proclaimed, it can be demonstrated, and most perfectly demonstrated, the righteousness of God at Calvary, right? That is where we see the righteousness of God and the love of God supremely manifest, don't we? We see it displayed, but that word means more than just to show. It means to be applied. We need a righteousness applied to us, right? That's what we need. Otherwise, we can't stand before a holy God. You cannot stand before a perfectly righteous God. We need to have it applied to our life. And so what we see in this first couple of verses is that God is the source of a right standing before him. He has provided it. Praise God. Hallelujah. He has provided that which we needed. That which without we would be eternally condemned. <coughs> now we see also and I won't talk much about faith because um, my brother has already shared on that and I saw on the, on the agenda, I think more was shared on that previous uh, nights. But we see that, that it is available to all who believe, but we know who those are who will believe, right? Those who God has appointed. Look at verse 22 again. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction Verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. I'll stop there. We'll go further on in that in just a moment. We've already seen in, in the first part of the book, um, the first three chapters, we see there's this incredible, purposeful, um, 
a plan of Paul by the Spirit of God to make sure that we understand that all have sinned, as we've just read, that all are unrighteous. And here we see the same is applied in, in salvation. All who believe, whether Jew or Greek, all who believe, right, are justified. All who have been regenerated are justified. Everyone, it doesn't matter whether you are a Pharisee or um, you are a prostitute, you come to God the same way, by grace, through the means of faith, because of God's regenerating grace. And so all are justified in the same manner because all have sinned. That's why it says in verse 22, for there is no distinction. We have no cause for boast, do we? Some protest, well, there are degrees of sinning, aren't there? Uh, let's even give there are degrees of sinning. I mean, we see some sins in the Old Testament that, that are an abomination to God. We don't see all sins that are an abomination. All sins are grievous to God, aren't they? But some are described as abomination. Jesus uh, speaks of, of sins in different ways, but all is sin. But even for the, if you want to just give that and say, okay, let's just take, uh, for the sake of argument, that there are a degree of sins. Listen to what Bishop Hanley Mool says. The harlot... The liar, the murderer, are short of it. That means God's glory. We, we often say, yeah, absolutely, they're all short of God's glory. But so are you. Isn't that what people need to know? So are you. Perhaps they stand at the bottom of a mine, and you on the crest of an alp, but you are as little able to touch the stars as they. <laughs> Isn't that right? Yeah. None of us are going to reach that glory, are we? We all far sh fall far short of it. We need to help people to see that, but only God is going to open their eyes to understand it. There's no distinction. But how can the unrighteous have a right standing before him? How can that be? Well, Christ is the only ground or basis for a right standing before God. There is no other way. There is no other grounds for us to have a right standing. It's only through Christ. It's only through his person and work. There is no other place to turn. There is no religious person that we can turn to. There is certainly not our works. And that's what we see in verse 24 and 25. For all, I'll start back at verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. I'll stop there for a moment. The unrighteous are justified by his grace as a gift. Let me, I'll get to the gift part in just a moment, even, even though Pastor Phillips has already addressed that. Well, let's talk about this idea of justify. What is this all about? It, it doesn't mean that we are made righteous as though somehow we've been made perfectly righteous. We don't believe in perfectionism. The Bible doesn't teach that. We will be glorified one day, praise God, but we haven't been glorified yet, have we? That's still yet to come. And so what does justify mean? It, it's not just even to, to be treated as righteous. It means to be declared righteous. It, it literally is a legal term. Some call it a forensic term. That means that we have a positive right standing with God. It's more than a pardon. It's more than an acquittal. It is a positive legal standing. A positive right standing. And here is the beginning of the application of righteousness. Remember in verse 21, remember back in chapter 1, verse 17, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested. This is what it means, ultimately, that this righteousness would be manifested. Not just displayed, but applied. Applied. So that we actually benefit from something substantial that's real. Righteousness. This righteousness we see is a grace gift. It comes as a free gift. Do you see the redundancy there in verse 24? And are justified by his grace as a gift. Well, both of those words essentially mean the same thing. It's God's unmerited favor. It's him giving favor to us. It's a gift. It could be his gift gift. There's, there's a number of ways you could say that, but ultimately it's saying the same thing so that we would get it, so that we would understand this is something that is only received as a gift. It's God's grace 
Justification cannot be earned. It cannot be merited. We can never do or jump through enough hoops to gain a right standing with God. It comes as a gift. This is also emphasized in chapter 4. If you look there at verse 4, we'll look more fully at this passage in just a moment, but look at verse 4. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. Problem. We are doing nothing from God. God is not obligated to man. We would never, we would never be able to indebt God. Do you understand? We don't earn a wage. There is a wage that we have earned. Romans 6.23 says, right? The wages of sin is death. That's the only wage that we have earned. Eternal hell. So that's why the next verse, verse 5, says, And to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. It's the one who doesn't work. It's the one who recognizes he has no work to offer. There's nothing that he can do. He can only depend in faith that God grants for his salvation. And so what God does is he gives freely, not out of obligation, so that only he, only he receives the glory. We have no boast. Look at Romans 3, verse 27. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. So whatever faith is, as we've just learned about, we need to understand one thing. It is not a work. It is not meritorious. It is nothing that we can boast about. It is a gift. It is a gift that comes from God. Some declare that justification is a legal fiction. A legal fiction. Have you ever heard of that before? And, and simply what that means, and the reason people say that is a legal fiction is because how can God simply declare the unrighteous to be righteous? That seems to be an unrighteous thing to do, to just say, okay, you're unrighteous, uh, you're unrighteous, you're gonna be righteous now. That seems to be an unrighteous thing to do. Proverbs 17, verse 15 says, he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. In, in other words, to declare the ungodly righteous what they're saying when they say this is legal fiction seems empty and hollow. It's, it's like just saying something that's not really true. Let me give you an illustration. We might equate it to a judge who hears a man's defense who is convicted or who is accused of a crime. A man gives his defense. All the evidence in the world is, is there. Caught red-handed, fingerprints everywhere. You know, 25 witnesses on video camera. They know that, that he's guilty, and, and, and there's no technicality. And so at the end of this, this judge is just having, you know, he's having kind of a good day, and he just says, not today, I just feel like saying that you're, you're, you're free, you're not guilty. Now, how would we view that judge? Righteous or unrighteous? Hopefully he'd be thrown off uh, of the bench, right? <laughs> that would be what we expect. That's why people think that this is legal fiction. You see, to be justified, though, involves more than that. And, and that's where we come to Romans chapter 4. You see, justification isn't only a declaration. There's something else that's undergirding it that we have to see. And, and that's found in our passage. And, and, and part of this is understanding this idea of imputation. We're not just declared righteous. We are credited with righteousness. It, we, we are, it's imputed to us. It's, it's, it's accounted to us. Look at chapter 4 again, verse 1. The example is being used of Abraham. Paul says, by the Spirit of God, what then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? That's a rhetorical question. What's the answer to that? What did he gain by the flesh? The answer is nothing. Look at verse 2. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. You might have something to boast about before man. 
before your family, before your coworkers, the plaque on your wall, the trophy that you kept from Little League, you know. But none of us have anything to boast about when we stand before God. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. Abraham, father of faith, has nothing to boast about. Oh no, he didn't gain anything by his flesh, by his works. Verse 3, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. That's it, isn't it? That's, that's Genesis 15. Verse 4, now to the one who works, we saw, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith, there it is again, this word counted, is counted as righteousness. The word counted is very important. It, it means reckoned, it can mean imputed, it's, it's an accounting term. It means to put something in someone's account. And it oftentimes is used to speak of, of someone who has a deficient account, and something is put there in order to overcome the deficiency, or to put something in an empty account in order to have something there. A credit is made. Any bookkeepers around? Any accountants? That's the kind of terminology that's being used here. Here is the glorious truth. We have nothing at all in our account, no righteousness, no merit at all. Not one single shred of good works. Nothing in our accounts but filthy rags. But God, for all you who are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, but God has put a perfect righteousness, the righteousness of Christ in our accounts. Isn't that a glorious truth? Isn't that wonderful? That's exactly what we need. To declare the ungodly righteous with no righteousness at all, I tell you what, that, that seems to, to be a problem. If there's no substance to it, if there's nothing to support it, if there's nothing undergirding it, but there's one piece already that we're seeing that's undergirding it. There's actually something there in the account. It's not just an empty tank. It's the perfect righteousness of Christ that's there undergirding it. That's what the declaration is being built upon. Let me give you an example. A person cannot be declared righteous unless there is a foundation. Just like, let's just give another example. Consider the, the same man. Let's just change the circumstances a little bit. The evidence actually is very sparse for him, for the accused. There's really not a whole lot there to convict him. It seems unconvincing. And so maybe he could be declared innocent even though he's guilty because there's, there's a substantive reason to declare him not guilty. There's just not enough evidence to, to declare him guilty. There is substance there. Our problem is this. The evidence is clear. We are guilty. There's no doubt about it. And so how can God declare us to be righteous? How can he do that legally? Only by crediting us with the perfect righteousness of Christ. That's how. When God justifies the ungodly, there is substance behind it. There is the true righteousness of Christ. The only sufficient ground for a right standing with God is the perfect righteousness of Christ. Now we're starting to see the doctrine of justification and imputation coming together here. But we have more questions. It's not, we haven't answered all the questions yet. How can the ungodly be justified and God still be considered righteous and not condoning sin? Because you know what? The imputation of righteousness only begins to answer that question. It doesn't answer it fully. Okay, so God takes Christ's righteousness and he puts it in our account. Something's still missing, isn't there? There's something still missing. Well, that's where we come to the next very important point. Justification of the sinner is possible only because of the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. That is the glorious, wonderful, supreme, unbelievable, unsearchable, glorious atonement. The atoning work of Jesus Christ. That's the foundation of it. That's the basis of it. And that's what we see in Romans chapter 3. And there are three things that we're going to see here, again, that I want to emphasize to you in chapter 3 and chapter 4. The first are, are really focused on in chapter 3. And that is the idea of redemption and the idea of propitiation. That's one of those, those terms I'll probably 
Good thing not too many people are sitting close because it makes you spit when you say it. Uh, it's a hard word to say, um, but it has significance for us, and we need to understand it. And then we'll take a look at another aspect of imputation. We've actually only looked at one part. Remember I told you this idea of double, double imputation? We need to look at the other side of that imputation to bring everything together so that we can understand this, this justification, this atonement. First of all, redemption. And that's what we see spoken of in verse uh, 24. And are justified by his grace as a gift. How? How can that be? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's how. Through redemption. Now, what is redemption? Redemption is a broad term used for salvation oftentimes, but it also has specific meaning. It, it reveals that if a right standing comes to the believer freely, if a right standing comes to the believer freely, it was not without cost. Because the word redemption has in its meaning to purchase to purchase something. It involves the idea of liberation through the payment of a price. And that's what Christ has done. He has paid a price. And so in the centuries leading up to the time of Jesus, redemption was often used in terms of ransoming a, a prisoner of war, a slave, a condemned criminal. You get the picture? That's the idea of redemption. And the redemption of man occurred at a great price really at an infinite price, if you want to be technical about it. You think about this for a second. Why is it so costly? Why is it so costly? Why is it such a high price? Because we owed an infinite debt, didn't we? We owed an infinite debt. Think about this for, for a moment. We didn't just break a rule you know, in, in our community by putting up a fence or something. We didn't just steal something and have to do our time and then we're done. We sinned. We hated, we rebelled against the infinitely holy God. That's who we sinned against. And we are all guilty and under judgment apart from Christ. And that judgment is what? Eternal hell. Eternal hell. That's an infinite cost, isn't it? That's an infinite debt. An infinite price had to be paid. An infinite price had to be paid. And, and that's just for one person, folks. An infinite price is for one person. And we, we bring all of God's elect in and we see the high price, it's infinite. How could such a costly debt be paid? How could such a ransom be given? How could the infinite debt be paid? Well, here's where we see the glorious work of Jesus Christ. It's because of the unique person and work of Jesus Christ. That's how, because of who he is, and what he and he alone could do. That's how. That's how the debt could be paid. It's more than what some call expiation. In other words, just putting away sin. We'll talk about this in just a moment. This idea here is propitiation. In some of the translations, it is, uh, it is translated the atoning sacrifice. Some expiation. But I like this word propitiation. And the reason why people don't use the word propitiation is because it has pagan, pagan background to it. Because in the pagan world, they offered propitiation to the gods, the pantheon of gods. They would offer up these sacrifices themselves. Man would offer up a sacrifice to appease these angry, capricious, random kind of gods that were made in man's image that weren't really gods at all. And so when, when, they, when people see this word translated propitiation in the Bible, they think, ooh, that's a pagan idea. We don't want to translate that here into the realm of the one true God. But I want to tell you, we ought to use this word. Amen. We ought to use this word because it's radically different when we see it in the Bible. There's the pagan idea of propitiation, and there's the biblical idea of propitiation. And what we see here, and what we see in 1 John 2, and what we see later on, we'll see in Hebrews chapter 2, is the biblical idea of propitiation. What is that? Well, it's right there in your text. Look at verse 25. How is this redemption accomplished? Look at it. Through whom God, he's talking about Christ, put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Did you catch that? Do you see the difference? Pagan idea, man offering his sacrifices to keep these gods off of his back. But what's the difference here? God, the Father, offered his son as a propitiation. 
to appease his own wrath. Did you, God offered his own sacrifice to appease his own wrath for those who hated him, who rebelled against him. That's the difference. If we can't praise God now, I don't know when we ever will. He didn't have to. It was in his glorious plan, for his glory, but for our good. I like what Stott says, he says, God himself gave himself to save us from himself. I'll say that one more time. God himself gave himself to save us from himself. That's what 1 John 4.10 is saying. This is love, not that we love God, but he loved us and gave his son as a propitiation for our sin to appease the wrath of God. How could this do? How can this be? How can this satisfy? Through the unique and perfect, infinite qualities of the Son, because He's infinite in worth, because He is the God-man, He is both God and man. He is the only mediator between God and man, First Timothy 2, 5 tells us. He has a unique ability to do that. And because of his perfect obedience, his perfect obedience, he always did the will of the Father. He was obedient to death, even death on a cross, Philippians 2 tells us. That's how. Now in my, I had a parenthesis in my topic that, that, that talks about passive and active obedience. All that's referring to passive and active obedience is that Jesus was obedient to all aspects of the law. Not just positively keeping the law, but also meeting the, the penal demands of the law. So oftentimes I, I, I like to, to think of it as much as passive and active, because passive almost implies, even though it's not true, that Jesus is just sitting back. Oh, no, no. He is actively doing the Father's will, willingly, volitionally doing. Right? It's in, in the counsel of the training Godhead that this was hatched. He knew what he is to do. I like what John Murray says. He says in this in his book, Redemption Accomplished and Applied. The law of God has both penal sanctions and positive demands. It demands not only the full discharge of its precepts, but also the infliction of penalty for all infractions and shortcomings. Christ as the vicar, the representative, the priest of his people, came under the curse and condemnation due to sin, and he also fulfilled the law of God in all its positive requirements. In other words, he took care of the guilt of sin and perfectly fulfilled the demands of righteousness. He perfectly met both the penal and preceptive requirements of God's law. That's what he did. That's, there's some substance now to this righteousness being credited, isn't there? Right? Because it's based on the work of Christ. The propitiatory work. Appeasing, satisfying the wrath and the justice of God. And then you have, in this verse, you see that, that this propitiation was by his blood. Why? Because the whole Old Testament is anticipating that every sacrifice is a shadow of the one that's to come. And Hebrews 9 tells us, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. It's anticipating the perfect, the one and only, the unblemished lamb, that sacrifice, who is the person of Jesus Christ, who is the high priest offering his own self as a sacrifice. By his blood, he is the sinless sacrifice that God's justice demands. See, it's not legal fiction, is it? There's something undergirding this justification. There's something undergirding this idea of being declared righteous. It's been imputed to our accounts. It's credited to our accounts based on the work of Jesus Christ. But there's one more piece that I want to finish with and we'll tie everything up here. And that is the second idea of imputation. There has to be another. Because if we're declared righteous, and there's still sin dwelling within us. When I say dwelling, I mean that, that we still are credited with sin. We have a problem because God, we find in Scripture, His eyes are holier than to behold iniquity. Our iniquity has separated us from God. And so something has to be done with that sin. Or there's, a, there's something, there, there's not a balanced equation between righteousness and sin. There's something wrong there. And so the ungodly are made right with God through another type of counting. Look at verse 6 and 8. 6 through 8. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. 
and whose sins are covered. This is right out of Psalm 32. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. There's that same word, count. This verses 7 and 8 are all about forgiveness. Blessed are those who are deeds forgiven. Sins are covered. And then we see the root of it. Why? Because our sins are not counted. They're not credited to us. How can that be? How can our sins not be credited to us? Because, because they have been judged. Because the wrath of God has been poured out upon <coughs> them. How? Through another kind of imputation. It's the same kind, really, except this is our sin that we own, that we're guilty of. That sin being credited to Jesus. Being credited to his account. That's what it means in 1 Peter 2.24. He himself bore our sin in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. That's what it means in 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's what it means. It's all rooted in Isaiah 53 when it says that he bore our iniquities. That means our sin was credited to him. The sin of all the belief was credited to him. So then God in his righteous wrath, pours down his wrath and judgment upon our sin, every bit of our sin, past, present, and future. He just poured down his wrath in the person of his son. So your sin, my sin, is no longer counted to us, no longer credited to our account, because it was credited to his. Your sin has been judged. The wrath of God has been poured out on your sin in the person of Jesus Christ. So here's the balance of the equation. Our sin that we own, credited to Jesus who did nothing, nothing wrong. There's no sin in him, but it was credited to him in order to satisfy the justice and wrath of God. It's removed from us as far as east is from the west. And God, by the means of Faith, because of the work of Jesus Christ and satisfying his just wrath, can then, can then credit the righteousness of Christ to our account. <coughs> Isn't that an amazing transaction? So that we now have a perfect righteousness in our account where we had none before? That is the glory of justification. That is the glory of the atonement. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones concludes from this passage in chapter 4. What does the doctrine tell me? It tells me that as I stand there on trial, my debt is canceled, my sin is covered, God has cast my sin behind his back, he will never look at it again, he will never see it again, it is blotted out, out of his sight for all eternity, and I shall never be charged with it as a crime. I am completely delivered from it, but over and above that, God puts into my account and reckons to me this righteousness of Jesus Christ, his Son. Amen? Amen. How? Well, you've already been taught about this. Look here, verse 25. And God put forward his propitiation by his blood to be received by faith, through the means of faith. <coughs> Not because we conjure up faith, but because God has ordained to bring his salvation through the means of faith to us by his grace as a gift. That's a glorious, glorious truth. God justifies the ungodly by faith. There is a righteous standing for the unrighteous. Hallelujah. It comes from God through the sufficient, wrath-absorbing, justice-satisfying, substitutionary <coughs> sacrifice of Christ on your behalf. It's received by faith alone. Let's just praise Him for it, shall we? Father, I praise you because these doctrines, Lord, they speak of your grace. They humble us. They remind us of our place. They remind us that apart from you, we have nothing. But we haven't found you, but you have found us. We know that we could never come to Christ except you draw us. We, like the Apostle Peter, understand we could never testify the true character of Jesus Christ lest the Father reveal it to us by His Spirit. And so, Lord, you get all the glory. 
and we enjoy the riches of this salvation. Would you glorify your name through us? Would you help us not to be just teachers of knowledge, that our doctrine would, would literally exude from our lives, the love of Christ would pour from us, that we would not be in a position of, of condemners. You have that role on us, but we hold forth the word of life. And we trust in your sovereign plan through your spirit to bring life to dead corpses like we were. <coughs> we pray this in the precious name of the Son who died for us, who was raised from the dead, who now rules and reigns and is coming again finally to take us to be with him. We pray in his name. Thank you for the read. Praise God for all the wonderful messages we've had this week. And all the men of God. And, you know, it's, it's comforting to know, to me, that there's that many countless on the Eastern Shore. It's pretty refreshing when you hear the truth preached, the same doctrines, the same gospel. And uh, very encouraging. So, so Rick, thank you for this one. Very, very well done. An in-depth study of the righteousness of, of Christ. Uh, praise God. Uh, I I gotta say this. Uh, your associates, your co-pastors, coming tomorrow night, and he inspired me to put these flowers here. Now I've got to tell you why. <laughs> 